Appreciate the worship team with a hand clap. Uh, tell your neighbor, arise, shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. I know that was a very serious neighbor. They're not even smiling. So turn to the other smiling neighbor. Tell them, arise, shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now let's make it a declaration. Let's say, Arise, shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Praise the Lord. Amen. We continue with uh, the theme, the year of the Lord's divine enablement. We are still catching the theme, vision. We are catching the vision because um, visions are not taught. Uh, you know, you catch them and you run with it. The difference between people who say, that was my year, and those who say, what a year it was, is the one who catches the vision and runs with it, something happens. And that's why we're taking two months of connecting with this theme vision, the year of the Lord's divine enablement. Divine enablement is another word for grace. And that's why we are doing a study called the Grace Course. And so part of the series we are running is also connected with the Grace Course, the study. It's a six-part series. And you can get a copy. We're doing it in the home fellowships. So we do something on the pulpit. At home, you do the study. Let's connect deeper with what God is saying in this season. Praise the Lord. And the title of today's message is Courageous. Courageous. Now, do not ask your neighbor if they are courageous. Because everybody says they are courageous. Until something happens. That's when you realize how courageous people are. And so... But when we talk about courage or being courageous, there's a word that we have to address. And the more we understand that word, the better we understand courage. And this word is fear. That many times, uh, courage is actually seen as the absence of fear. But the way I look at it is something different. That courage is, is that just that ability of you know, being able to move on in spite of the fear within. In spite of the fear within. Um, Steve Goss in the book Grace Course defines fear as an emotional reaction that triggers a physical response in our bodies that comes from the perception of, imp of impeding danger or harm. And so we find there's something there to do with trigger. We are getting another word there. Is our bodies, we are hearing something about perception, and we're hearing impeding, meaning the danger has not come, but we can almost see like it is coming. And just that perception, that is, there is impeding danger, then fear comes in. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture together, and media take us to uh, Numbers, the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13, as we look at how to be courageous. Numbers 13, thank you 
for taking us there. And we read, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send, the, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Tell your neighbor, everyone a leader among them. Now let's move on media all the way to verse 21. Let's go to verse 21. Verse 21 tells us, So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Ishkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Verse 27. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, tell anybody, nevertheless. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. They are Malachites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Anks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are, we are well able. Tell your neighbor, I am well able to overcome. Now, but they don't think you're serious, by the way. Just tell him, I am well able to overcome. But, tell anybody, tell anybody, but, but the men, I suspect these were Kenyans, by the way, I, but, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. A bad every day I read a bad report when I'm walking on the streets I read bad report in the evening I listen to some bad reports so we are no exception because they also had a bad and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying the land through which we had gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Aina came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, speak. Speak through your word. Turn this Logos word into Rema. May it come to life. May it speak to each one of us. And take us to your place of promise. In Jesus' name we pray. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. Tell your neighbor perception. Now, how you see yourself affects how you do whatever you do. Because as I read this scripture here, and I've read many other scriptures, have you seen a place that says, and the sons of Enoch appeared? And they told them, 
you Israelites, you are grasshoppers. Nini ni dede. Dede, 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 or dede. Did you see that? Those who do not know what dede is, dede is grasshopper. There is nowhere they told them that. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. So you can imagine the size of a grasshopper and the size of a man. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. Now, in some places, grasshoppers are delicacies. Now, don't look at me like that. I, I did not say in your place. I said in some places. And, and when I was a little boy, I experimented eating grasshoppers. And we roasted them, de And Kwanzaa, the thorax is very sweet. When you put it through the fire and you crunch it, it's very nice. I don't know what adults would do to me. You're smiling like you've also eaten grasshoppers. <laughs> you may not say, yeah, I can say. In fact, we used to put them like skewers. You put something right through it. Then you rotate it inside the fire. You just rotate. Eh? <laughs> rotate. My mother has no idea. <laughs> but I ate them. So you can imagine, that's how they saw themselves. Your self-perception informs how you do a lot of things. If you see yourself as unable, it does not matter how many times you are encouraged. Because you've already chosen to see yourself as what? Unable. It does not matter how much ability is in you, if you've already seen yourself as unable. Self-perception. The ladies in the house may understand this better than the men. If you're going for a very important function and you're a lady, and then you dress up, and then you know the common question, Niko And then you're told, eh, uko smart. You say, Hio, eh, has a point. So you go back and work out again. Then you come back and you look and say, Niko eh, Sasa, you still said, eh. So, if you go for the function, you're not feeling smart within you. And so someone tells you, hey, today you are smart. You say, <laughs> you know, you're just trying to impress me. The issue is not whether you're smart or not. The issue is your perception about yourself. Your perception about yourself. And we are finding right here that of the 12 spies, 10 of them believe that they are like grasshoppers in their own sight. And so we were in their sight. We usually make a conclusion that the way we see ourselves is the way other people see us. But the reality is how other people see you may not be the way you see yourself. Perception. Perception informs reality. Perception informs reality. Ask your neighbor, what's your perception about yourself? So do not wait for an answer. You, you, you just had it. What is your perception about yourself? Because the way you see yourself affects a lot of things. Now if we continue um, with chapter 14, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and, and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Uh, tell anybody rebellion. Now that's a rebellion, by the way. There's like a rebellion brewing. They already have Moses as a leader. They have Joshua and Caleb who went with them to spy the land. And suddenly they are saying, no, 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 no. Let's go back where we came from. Let's go back where we came from. And many times, even people who believe in God, 
when a little hardship comes, they say, oh, let's go back to where we used to be before. Let's go back to the life we used to be in. Let's go back to comfort zone. It's a very tempting thing to go back to the comfort zone. Because it looks too hard to go ahead. Let us go back. Let us go back. Let us select a leader. So if you think coup d'etat happens only in Africa, you're mistaken. There are, coup d'etats have always happened throughout history. And this was a nice coup d'etat. We just select a leader and he leads us back to where we came from. And we are finding scripture is telling us that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us, do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meetings before all the children of Israel. Every journey we get to, if it's worth it, has a resistance. Every journey we get to, if it's a journey of marriage, you'll find resistance at one point. If it's a journey of a new job, you'll find resistance at one point. If it's a journey of physical fitness, for very many years, I used to jog from the little balcony of my room. And I used to stand at the balcony, uh, the other window, I have a window balcony, kind of. So it's a window and it looks like a balcony. So I used to stand there and I would gaze through all the area and I would finish my laps in my mind. Hallelujah. And then I hit 40. You know there are ages that you don't get, you just hit. You turn 20, you turn 25, you turn 32. But now when you hit 40, you no longer jog with your eyes. You do physical jogging. Can, can the men say amen? The men are refusing to say amen. Stop jogging like I used to. Do real jogging. Because seasons have changed, isn't it? When seasons change, you have to do something about it. You have to do something about it. And, and we are finding that anytime you have a journey, anytime you have a new beginning, anytime you have a new blessing, challenges also come. And one of the things that holds people back is fear. They don't have the courage to move on. They don't have the courage to fight on. I want to stay where I have always been. And the Lord is saying, I don't want you to stay there. I want you to move forward. For your blessing is in moving forward. Not in remaining where you are. I'm not talking about phobia. You know, because, uh, you know, fear is what I'm focusing on. Not about phobia. Now, phobia is, uh, we are told, uh, it's natural to feel scared, especially when dealing with anything that poses a threat to your life. However, when fear is out of proportion to the perceived threat, such that you react in an irrational manner, it is a phobia. Have you ever had been in a place and then a rat came? You know a rat? The ones that do marathon rats. One time we went to a place for a meal. I won't stay with who here. And suddenly a rat... <laughs> <laughs> came passing at high speed. That brother raised his leg so quickly and then paused. I asked him, what is it? I don't like these things. <laughs> and he was very conscious because that place that we went, you know pastors go to all kind of places. We go to places where rats do a rat race. We go to places where you can't even see a cockroach. One has to And let me tell you, for me, I'm not scared of rats. I'm not scared of rats. I'm not scared of squirrels. Uh, you know, I have a phobia for two things. One, heights. Heights. So one day, uh, we were having a meeting with Pastor, Masha, Pastor Washira. Pastor Washira, we used to serve together and went back to Parkland. I was up one time, he said, we know, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, just a two pastors meeting. And so he told me, let's meet at Teleposter Towers. Now, Teleposter Towers is a tall building. 
And so uh, I went there. Now, he used to work for telecommunications that time, and I was working in another telco, but we're in different departments. Him, he was on the engineering side. I was on the supply chain side. So, uh, so I went. So he told me, I am up here. You just come. So I got into the lift, and I went. So the lift reached the end of the lift. So I came out, told me, where are you? I am up here. So you just climb the stair and come. So I climbed the stair. Then I asked him, where are you? I am still up here. Now, that brother was in the, at the tower. There's a tower up there. And so he told me, no, you just come. So I started climbing that tower. Let me tell you, suddenly I saw the city. <laughs> this city of Nairobi is very beautiful, if you didn't know. Especially from that vantage point. The only challenge is... It started going forward and backwards. You know, towers swing in the wind. Uh, and something reminded me, you and Heights are not friends. So I told him, come, we talk here. He said, no, 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 you just, just climb. <laughs> I told him, I am not coming. <laughs> that time, the concept of I am not boarding had not happened. I would have told him, I'm not boarding. And so uh, he asked me, what is it? You can't climb. I say, I can't climb. <laughs> it is just that I am feeling a little kizungu zungu. Uh, you come down. So he came down. We met in one of the, one of the um, uh, server rooms. And we had a very productive meeting. What he didn't know is, I had a fear for what? Heights. A phobia for heights. And when I was little, I had a huge phobia for, for, for injections. Now, I used to be taken to see the doctor. And from the house, I was very sick, especially when they used to make a certain meal called maram. Uh, maram is a very complicated meal. Very complicated indeed. It's made of uh, some grains, two types of grains. The only problem was the ratio of one grain over the others. <laughs> the ratio of the, one of the grains was 90. It was a ratio of 90 to 10. And it used to be dried in the hottest sun in our village. And that sun had to be so hot, it used to drain all the liquids out of the white grain. So when they would make that delicacy, which would last for a whole week, I would suddenly fall sick. By the second day, I was so sick, I couldn't even go to school. And in those days, you have to be taken to the doctor. And then when I enter the doctor's premises, and he removes the syringe like this, and then it's a bang, bang, <laughs> I would get healed. I had a phobia for what? Syringe. So I don't know if it was a phobia for syringe <laughs> or for the product that was cooked in the house. I'm here to conclude which was which. Phobia. Now, I'm not talking about phobia. We are talking about fear. And we'll focus on fear. And we find that effects of fear are unhealthy, especially when it, you have so much fear, it closes down your life. It closes down your life. There are things you don't do because you're afraid. Somebody one day asked, what could you do if you're not afraid? Fear holds people back. They are afraid. Some people have the fear of rejection. What if I am rejected? So they don't try. Some people cannot close a cell. They say, I can sell in every other place except this place. So you ask them, have you ever gone there? No. But I am very sure. If I go, they will say, no. And then they meet other people who also say the same. Even me, I cannot sell where? There. People in insurance industry, can I hear amen? Have you come across those kind of people? I can sell except where? So one of the characters in that group discovers they all cannot go there. Then they go there and they get that big order. One has a few. So when the rest are actually looking for numbers, then they are playing golf because they made one sale and it was enough. Uh, I'm saying, because they could not go there, <laughs> because the others were afraid, isn't it? The one who was not afraid, who had courage, they went and made the sale. It was such a big sale. It's like they've closed their sales for the whole. Do you know you can make us one sale which locks your ear? Do you know it's possible? And fear holds people back. Some people never apply for certain jobs. They say, I cannot go there. They cannot accept me. Now, wait a minute. You have already concluded they can't accept you, but you have not even applied. You know, people go to heaven, and they'll tell God, I'm just imagining, 
why didn't you bless me with this? And he'll tell you, I had it for you. But you never asked. Matthew 7. So you never received because you never asked. And fear holds people back. Some people have the fear of death. Some people have the fear of people. Jeremiah 17.5. What does it say, media tell us? Jeremiah 17.5. It says, Thus says the Lord, Cast is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. The fear of people. The fear of people. And many people are stuck there. They are afraid of people. What will people say? What will people think about me? And so people are willing to sin against God and please people. The fear of man. Cast is the man who puts his trust in, in man. Another fear that's very common is the fear of confrontation. We have what I call a people-pleasing culture. Not a truth culture. We don't tell people the truth. If I tell him the truth, he will hate me. He won't like me. And because of that, we don't correct people. People make mistakes, but we cannot tell them they are wrong because they will not like me. So those people keep making the same mistakes, keep falling in the same traps, but you can see it and you say, I knew. Why did you tell me? They don't talk. The fear of confrontation. And people have very, very many fears. Now, I don't know what is your fear. The fear of failure. In fact, fear of failure. I'll not ask you to raise your hand, but I believe some of us have struggled with that, isn't it? The fear of failure. Especially if you have failed. Now, many of you have not failed. I have. Praise Jesus. I have failed in my life. Not once. Not twice. No. I have failed many times. And so, because of having failed quite a good number of times, trying something and failing. I said failing. Uh, I mean failing. You see, and failing is relative. This is how it works. I had a cousin when we did um, Form 4. And I was an average student myself. This guy was a straight A. So you can imagine him he was saying, I don't know if I should take law or medicine. Me, I've been called for bachelor of anything. <laughs> <laughs> and him, he has so much choice. Or maybe I should do engineering. He was the most boring guy in the world. <laughs> then he asked me, Ben, what do you think? You know, <laughs> that's a very bad question to ask me. So I asked him, you, what do you want? Well, I think law, I think law has good money. All right. I say, I think so. <laughs> but I think medicine is even better. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I'm trying to tell him, dude, I'm tired of your talk. Cut his story up. And there I am. And of course, that's when you're asked, so uh, what did you get? Have you ever gone for many meetings? And when you're in my category, you ask, so what did you get? I hear so and so got this, and so and so got this. So what did you? And that is when Najipatia Shuguli, and that's when I say, uh, yeah, I was going to visit Uncle Tom. Tuonane. God bless you. That's when keshas are very important. Hallelujah. Hey, you go for Kesha Pana. Unatuliza. Nikubaya. So, fear of failure. And sometimes it holds us back. It holds us back. It holds us back. I don't know what your fear is. But what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us something about what God has to say. And, the, and there are three promises God has given us. God has given us some promises. He, first of all, He tells us that uh, in 2 Timothy 1.7, what does he say? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The NIV version puts it this way. For the spirit of God gave, for the spirit 
God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline or a sound mind. So the spirit of fear is not the spirit of God. He gave us power, he gave us love, and a sound mind. He promised us victory in Joshua 1, 5 to 6. It's a promise of victory that he has given us. If we look at a promise of prosperity, Joshua 1, 7 to 8, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from me to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. So if we remain in his law, on what he's telling us, we will prosper. It's a promise of prosperity. And then he tells us also in Joshua 1, 9, the promise of his presence. He says, Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God is with you wherever you go. You know, wherever you go, he's with you. We have guests today who've come to worship with us. He's with you. Hallelujah. And when you go to another country, he'll still be with you. When you go back home, he'll still be with you. He promised to be with you. He promised to be with you. Many times um, when people sing songs, they sing songs that, that I'll never leave you. You know, how am I supposed to live without you? That's a lie. After you part company, how come they are still living? You know, when I was younger, in my early younger days, um, there were some, lots of songs. And, uh, and done, many songs were being sung about people who loved each other. And one of the songs was, how am I supposed to live without you? You know, how am I supposed to live without you? My friend, after parting company, the character keeps on living. And they're wondering how they can live. Only God, is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. They tell you, I won't leave you. That's a lie. You know? There was even a song. There's a character who sang a song that said, I would die without you. Would you believe that? <laughs> Imagine, Brother Deuri. At someone was singing a song like that. I would die. Oh, I would die without you. And then the listener is very convinced. They would not die. They keep living. Why? Because the only one who's with you wherever you are is who? Is God. Praise Jesus. So there are three promises. The first promise, tell your neighbor, it's a promise of victory. A promise of prosperity. A promise of his presence. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But how do you live courageously as I, as I conclude? What are some of the things that hold us back from living courageously? How do you appropriate God's promise? The first thing is dealing with sin. We find it in Genesis 3.10 that Adam hid because of unresolved sin issues. Because unresolved sin issues make us vulnerable to sin. They make us vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, we're not able to live courageously. Because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses you before God the Father. So when sin is in us, it stands between us and a holy God. And because God is holy, and then in that point, then you're not able to live courageously, for you are afraid. Just as Adam was afraid, he recognized that he was naked. The next thing is, deal with the lie behind the fear. Remember, Steve Goss puts it this way, behind every unhealthy fear, there is a lie. Ephesians 2, 6. What does it say? Media take us there. Ephesians 2, 6. Let's see what the scripture says and we look at one example of uh, the lie behind the fear. Ephesians 2, 6. It says, um, it tells us here, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. What does verse 7 say? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Just go back to 6 because it reminds us exactly who we are in Christ. That we are raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we are raised up. Verse 5, what does it say? Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
Praise Jesus. So that is our position in Christ. Yet, because sin has a way of coming between us and God, if we don't go to him in repentance, then it holds us back. So the lie tells us we are not acceptable before God. So we cannot live courageously. We cannot live a victorious life because sin is standing between us and God. And believing the lie. Like the person going for a function, but they believe they don't look good. They've been in the salon for 18 hours. Uh, I said 18 hours. Now, ladies, this is for your sake. According to men, when a lady goes to the salon for one hour, one hour is four hours. Hallelujah. Four hours is how many hours? 16 hours. That's how we see it. Can I hear an amen from the men? <laughs> yeah, they understand these things. After you look, come on looking gorgeous. But if you feel you're not looking good, if you feel you're not good enough, if you are convinced within yourself that you're not presentable enough, there is a lie. You have to find what is behind the lie. What is informing the lie? Because perception, perception actually informs your reality. So what is your perception? And thirdly, deal with knowing God, not about God. Steve says, when a lie is deeply ingrained, it becomes a stronghold, a habitual way of thinking. Romans 12, 2 tells us something. What does 12, Romans 12, 2 tell us? Something it tells us about our minds, about renewing our minds. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And perfect will of God. Deal with knowing God and not about God. What is this deeply ingrained lie? It becomes a stronghold. I met a family one time, and we we're just about to pray, where in that family, children, when they study, their highest academic level is Form 4. Highest. And this is how it was informed. In the many years ago, the, 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 when they used to go to school, they had lots of economic challenges. And so one of the members made it to Form 4. And they decided that that is their highest level of education. And so in that family, they never pass Form 4. Even when they have resources, they don't. Because they believed a lie that they can never make it to a higher institution of learning. And that was a lie that they're not good enough. That they can never go beyond that. And these lies, if you don't find what is behind the lie, it becomes your reality. So what is this lie of the enemy that has become your new reality? The word of God should inform your reality. Not the enemy and the lie that he brings. Sometimes people believe they are not good enough. They are not sharp enough. They are not bright enough. They are not gifted enough. They are not beautiful enough, whatever beauty is. What is a lie that the enemy has brought before you that has created a spirit of fear that has prevented you from getting the promise God has given you? Some people say, I can't go back to school. I am too old. Have you ever heard of that lie? Yeah, it's a lie of the devil. I am too old. We had a man called Marunge. Was he 84 years? And he went to primary school. Was he 84? Yeah, he was 84. And he went to school and he wore a big shirt and a shirt and he sat in class. And somebody's 32. And they're saying, Pastor, you know, I am very old. When I go to that class, I'll be classmates with my nephews and nieces. How many years does it take to go back for the program? Four years? There's always a lie that the enemy pushes. And we need to decipher and find out what this lie is. For when it comes, it stands.